You know what, if you're a sports fan or a music fan, it doesn't matter. If you love both, even better. Because you know in sports you get these super teams where you get the best of the best. Players from different teams that come together on one team. You're expecting greatness. You get musicians from different bands that come together. Great bands especially, you're expecting greatness. And one band that delivered on that, at least initially, was Velvet Revolver. Look, when Scott Weiland slash Duff McKeegan, Matt Sorum, and Dave Kushner showed up on the scene as Velvet Revolver, there was a lot of excitement. As rock fans, we didn't quite know what to expect from the group, but we knew one thing. We were pretty sure it was going to turn into something great. Let's start this off in 1996. The band Guns N' Roses, there was a lot of friction going on between band members. And most of us wouldn't know because it was behind the scenes. But until it hit its boiling point, we wouldn't see it, but it was in fact about to hit a boiling point and there was huge changes coming for that band. First thing, and this has to be the biggest thing, honestly, you had Duff McKagan and Slash walking out the door. They were not seeing eye to eye with Axl Rose on what his vision was for GNR moving forward. Now the following year in 1997, they would end up firing drummer Matt Sorum which is kind of ironic because Matt Sorum was actually the replacement drummer for GNR's original drummer, Steven Adler. They ended up firing Steven Adler years before because of his pretty bad drug use. Those three, they were out the door. Now Guns N' Roses was gonna move in a different direction entirely and it would be years before we would see a classic Guns N' Roses reunion. Now, the guys went back to familiar territory. Slash went back and reformed a band he was in previously, Slash's Snake Pit. Duff McKagan went back, reformed a band he was in, 10 Minute Warning, and then Matt Sorum went back and played with The Colt, which is one of the bands he was with prior to joining Guns N' Roses. So in 2002, Randy Castillo died from cancer. Now, Randy Castillo was a drummer. He had drummed for Ozzy Osbourne and his band in the 80s, throughout the early 90s. He even drummed with Motley Crue. I believe it was from 99 to 02. It was a couple years he was with them. Now, Slash McKagan and Sorum had got together because there was a concert to commemorate Randy. And while there, there was members of Cypress Hill, they worked with them, and members of Buck Cherry, Keith Nielsen, and Josh Todd. Now, the three guys, the former Guns N' Roses members, realized, you know, that, that fire was still there, and they enjoyed playing with each other. And on the side, they started working with Todd and Nielsen on some, you know, original material, which they said they had a blast doing, and there was plans to start a band with the two which eventually they decided not to move forward with it. Another band that McKagan was with before and he was actually playing with them again at this time was the band Loaded. They were doing a show at the Viper Room in West Hollywood. Slash was there, Storm was there, and a man named David Kushner was there who actually was introduced to Slash by McKagan, but the thing was Slash and Kushner already knew each other. They went to junior high together, they went to high school together, so there was already a friendship there. So they started jamming out together, Sorum, Kushner, Slash, and McKagan. And they were having a blast. They said it just felt natural. They said with Kushner there, he brought a cool vibe and it was just very chill. Matter of fact, they were planning on keeping that band together, doing a little tour around LA. And the funny thing was, Izzy Stradlin, the former rhythm guitarist for Guns N' Roses, actually came in to join them for a few weeks. They said they could never tell if Izzy was serious. So they ended up auditioning Kelly Schaefer, who was in the band Atheist and Neurotica, to come in. And as soon as that happened, Izzy left. So now you had these four guys, Slash, McKagan, Kushner, Sorum. They wanted to jam out. They wanted to do this thing, and they just needed a singer. And this turned into probably a lot bigger than what they were expecting. In fact, VH1 turned it into a special, the fact that they were looking for this lead singer. It was a VH1 special. It was called The Rise of Velvet Revolver. They just needed a singer. They were auditioning tons of guys. Sebastian Bach from Skid Row was one guy that auditioned. Ultimately didn't get it. A couple big names declined auditions. Miles Kennedy, he declined it. Ian Asbury of the Colt declined it. Mike Patton, Faith No More. They actually wanted him to come in. He declined it. Another guy that turned them down was Stone Temple Pilots lead singer, Scott Weiland. One, Stone Temple Pilots was still together at the time. Two, they actually sent him some demo tapes of their material. First time Scott Weiland heard it, he said it sounded like bad company gone wrong. And the second one they sent them, he actually he actually was fond of it. He said it sounded like core era Stone Temple Pilots. But again, he was still with Stone Temple Pilots, so he declined. I'm honestly going to give the guys in the band some credit because they were persistent. 
When Stone Temple Pilots did disband in 2003, they sent new music to Wyland once again. This time, he went in the studio and he laid the vocals down for it. He actually hand delivered it back to the guys in the band, the rest of the guys, Slash, McKeegan, Sorum, and Kushner. So they listened to it, they loved it. This would end up being the song Set Me Free by Velvet Revolver. But even when Scott delivered it, he said he really wasn't too sure if he wanted to do the project or not with the guys. But ultimately he did. And that song, Set Me Free, was re-recorded. And they did a song, cover song, Pink Floyd's Money. Both of those songs ended up on two of the hottest movies that year, soundtrack. The Hulk movie and The Italian Job. So the song, Set Me Free, actually topped at 17 on the mainstream rock chart that year. And you gotta realize, they weren't getting any radio play at the time. And they weren't even signed to a label yet. So that shows you right there. I I'm not saying. So it's all about the advantage. These guys' advantage was, for one, it was Slash on guitar, Duff McKeegan on bass, Matt Sorum on drums, Dave Kushner on rhythm, and Scott Weiland on vocals. That's all the advantage you need. The song was being played on those soundtracks. It was in the movie. So that's promotion right there. So you got some of the hottest names in rock music history, and you got a song being played on two of the hottest movies that summer. So right there was enough to get the guys the foundation they needed. Now it was just up to them. Do they want to move forward or not? Well, we know <laughs> they move forward. So the table was set. These guys were together. They were Velvet Revolver. They did a show at the El Rey Theater and it was a hell of a performance. I mean, this got them noticed. They were already noticed. People had their eyes on this project. They wanted to see what was going to happen of it. But they did the song Set Me Free, which was already gaining traction. They did an early version of Slither, which, I mean, was the same version, but it was the first time people were hearing it by Velvet Revolver. They did some cover songs by Nirvana, the Sex Pistols, and Guns N' Roses. I mean, they lit that joint up that night, and people were like, okay, okay, this might be what we were expecting. Let's see where the guys go from here. So now they were getting ready to get in the studio to do their debut album. Now, a lot of stuff happened around this time. For one, the guys had already had some material written. Scott went in the studio rearranged it to fit his you know vocal range his style and he recorded it and then they wrote some new songs that all were going to be on the album now everything was looking good it was at this time when scott was at the studio he ended up getting arrested in the parking lot of the studio for possession of drugs now are we surprised not really but obviously this created a little speed bump in the process. So Contraband was the album, June 8, 2004 is when it was released. Now with huge help by the single Slither, it took off fast. I mean this song was amazing. I remember hearing Slither the first time on the radio I was like this, this song is badass. This is a rock and roll song. And it really had me wondering when the guys got together. This album release, I said was going to be really commercialized to just try to sell you know, copies and just be big and make money? Was it going to be a big PR stunt? What was this going to be? Well, no, no. This was a rock and roll album. The guys definitely, definitely hit a home run. 250,000 copies sold in the first week. 4 million copies sold worldwide. Well, well over 4 million copies sold. 2.9 million just in the United States alone. Certified double platinum. Absolutely and awesome. Slither and Fall to Pieces were their two biggest singles off the album. They did amazing. These guys, whatever they set out to do, if it was this, they did it. No doubt Contraband was a success. The album was a hit. The guys did a hell of a job. And, I mean, there's no doubt. They were everywhere. They were performing on late night shows. They were performing on award shows. They were winning awards. I mean, they were even on more soundtracks to movies. They were on the soundtrack to the Fantastic Four movie that was a huge hit that year. I mean, the guys were all over. And they were ultimate professionals. These guys have been doing it a long time in this business. The fact that they went out to promote the album on a 19 month tour. That's over a year. That's a long time to be out touring, to be around each other so much. I mean, they did the United States and Europe twice in this tour. Australia, New Zealand, they were all over. But again, that's a long time together. And all these guys had a history of alcohol and substance abuse issues. And they fell back off the wagon. Except for Kushner. The rest of the guys, they were just back at it, going hard. You know, it was around this time that Slash said, this is when he started to feel the disconnect. Feel a little bit lost, like the band was losing. And the whole spirit that they had at the beginning was starting to decline. Velvet Revolver announced in 2005 they were going to work on a second studio album, Libertad. That was going to be the name of the album. And they had a standard now. Contraband did freaking awesome. So now you got to try to live up to that. That's every musician or band's goal. You have a successful album, you want to at least equal that or do better. You don't want to go backwards, but that doesn't mean you fail if you do, but they had a standard now. Originally, the legendary Rick Rubin was going to produce this album. And while they were in the studio with Rick, they said, for one, 
his methods just didn't work for what they were trying to do. Two, it's Rick Rubin, so he was working with a ton of other musicians, so it just ended up not working out. But at Scott Weiland's request, they brought in Brendan O'Brien to produce the album. And Slash said he loved it. He said this guy was disciplined. He had a firm grasp on the studio and what was going on with the guys. And the fact that he knew how to play every instrument, he could jump in at any time and play along with the guys, just made them feel more at ease about what they were doing on this album. So after completion of the second album, before the guys released it, they went out and did a couple cool things, in my opinion. For one, they ended up inducting Van Halen into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2007, which when the guys spoke, it was only Slash and Wyland that spoke on behalf of the band. Nobody else said anything, but I mean, the influence that Van Halen had on these guys, and I'm sure the rest of the guys in the band was evident when they spoke, and it's Van Halen, so they definitely belong in the Rock Hall of Fame. And then they went on to go down to South America and do a little tour with Aerosmith. I mean, the connections are there with the music industry. These guys had connections all over the place, so it's not like, okay, yeah, they were a new band, but they weren't new to anybody in that scene, in that world, so they, they had an extra step up the ladder even before they started so now that they've done released a freaking awesome album and they were already about to release a second they got to do what not a lot of other bands would get to do in their situation so the album was released in july of 2007 did not get out to as fast a start as contraband their previous album and some songs made the charts didn't top as high as the singles from the previous album but you know again it wasn't a horrible album it was good but I got kind of what I expected from the first album from this album. The first album seemed like more effort and seemed decent, <laughs> to say the least. Second one, I didn't get that vibe. Felt more forced and like they were just trying to get an album out and just didn't seem the same as the first. I mean, it was a big difference to me. I, I don't know if a lot of people noticed that. But they went out on tour. They toured with Owls and Chains. Kick-ass tour. Now, later, later the next year, 2008, with Wyland kind of falling off that wagon and it was slowly but surely happening each and every day he ends up getting arrested for crashing his car and he gets arrested for being under the influence of drugs i mean just god you're talking about a killing momentum wyland knows how to kill momentum just ask the guys from stone temple pilot later in 2008 they were set to do some touring in australia and all the shows were postponed and the reason given out to ticket buyers was health issues for wyland when really Later on, it turned out to be more than that because all the shows were canceled. And <laughs> Wyland made his way back to Los Angeles, entered a rehabilitation center, which that only goes as far as he's going to let it go, which wasn't far. They get back out on tour a couple months later. They're in the UK. And they say the guys, they did not even talk to Wyland, except for a few arguments backstage. There was not any conversations. And on one show in Glasgow, he announced to the crowd, he being Wyland, that this was going to be the band's last tour because that's what he was under the impression of but really the other guys in the band they had other plans they were getting ready to fire his ass once scott wyland was gone from velvet revolver in 2008 that was a whole song and dance and this played out for a while with velvet for trying to find a new lead singer and dabbling in all kinds of stuff but in the end nothing really fit the what, what the guys had at the beginning with the five guys they had originally that was velvet revolver and and you knew it wasn't a permanent thing i mean these guys had their legacy in other bands, but this was something they were doing at the time. All the way up to 2012 when they did a one-off with Scott Weiland and they did this little concert and it went off without a hitch. It was a good show. And then for the next couple years, it was, you know, will Weiland join back permanently? And there was even a thought, even Weiland admitted it at one point on an interview that he was going to be back with the band on a permanent basis, only to be debunked a couple days later by Slash doing an interview on a radio show saying that was not true. So... I mean, it was all a bunch of crap. We we know that it was done when Wyland left, no matter what happened after that. And the sad part is, we know in 2015, they found Scott Wyland dead in a hotel room. And in 2016, McKeegan, Slash, they were back with Guns N' Roses. And Guns N' Roses, since that day, they're still torn around. And they're back together. And that's where Slash and Duff belong. And Scott belonged with Stone Temple Pilot. That, that's where he made his history at. And there will never be anybody to fill his place in STP. Just like no guitarist or bassist can come in and replace Duff and Slash in Guns N' Roses. So, from the beginning, when Velvet Revolver came on the scene, I think it was the perfect time for that. I mean, the guys came on right at the right moment. They came out with the right songs, the right sound, and it just fit that moment in music. So, 
no matter what happens, forever in history, Velvet Revolver will be known for what they did, especially that first album, Contraband. Great album, great songs, and the guys did a hell of a job, and I give them all my praise. I mean, no matter what they've done in the history they've made with their other bands, which is on an iconic level, Velvet Revolver ain't on that level, but they did do something great. And again, thank you guys for giving that to us. So we're going to end the video for today. I appreciate you coming and watching it. If you like the video, please like and subscribe. That'll help me grow. And go out there. Go for something big. Take care of your family. Go for your dreams. Have fun in life. Don't be afraid to go for something. And never let nothing hold you back. Until next time, take care of yourself. I'm out.